Justice Stratus is going to be the chair, and he's going to introduce the three students that we have that we're going to be speaking today. So. Well, we have three excellent students with excellent papers. This should be a good session. What uh, we thought we'd do is we'd have each student in turn uh, present their paper here at the podium for roughly 15 minutes. And then right after the student has presented her or his paper, we'll open it up for five minutes of questions right away. So unlike the other panels, we're not going to wait to the end. We're going to strike while the iron's hot. So get ready to ask your questions on these interesting and provocative papers right after they finish their presentations. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce you, uh, in order from my left, uh, the students we have and their papers. The first student is Claire Truesdale, a third year student at the University of Victoria. And her paper is entitled Section 15 and the Oaks Test the slippery slope of contextual analysis. The next student is Erin Smith, a third year student from Queen's University, and her paper is Efficiency as the Only Reasonable Limit, How Section 1 is an Efficient Breach Analysis. And finally, we have Mark Zion from the University of Alberta, another third year student, and his paper is entitled Braving the Balance, Oaks analysis restaged. So, without further ado, Claire, would you like to take the podium? Thank you. So thank you to the organizers. Uh, I'm, I'm a little nervous because uh, Ritu Kuhar just said that she avoids section 15 because it's really complicated. And that's what my presentation is on, so hopefully I can make it clear enough. Um, but it ties in really well with the previous panel, um, and particularly the comments that uh, Chris and uh, Mathen made. Um, on the difficulty in she found in finding a women's equality case that had actually made it to section one. Um, because my paper is on uh, a trend in judicial decision making towards assessing considerations that arguably belong under section one under section 15 and sort of conflating the, the two tests and thereby really lessening the role of section one in discrimination cases. So in my paper, I do a bit of a qualitative analysis of a couple of Supreme Court Canada cases, and then I also do an empirical analysis to try to gauge whether academic criticisms of this conflating of the test, um, whether there's any statistical sort of backup for that observation. And then I discuss some implications of these findings. Um, so I wrote this paper for an equality class, so that's why it's really focused on section 15. And um, sort of the inspiration for it came in, came in a roundabout way. I was first, I really wanted to write something about uh, section one justifications just because of a real gut reaction I had to the NAEP case and really feeling that cost, especially with the the little evidence that was provided really shouldn't be a justification for that kind of discrimination. And so I wanted to examine what sort of justifications the court had used in the past um, for under Section 1 for discrimination cases. And so I did a little bit of research and realized that actually very few discrimination cases, relatively, or relatively few, actually get to the Section 1 stage and started doing a little research on academic criticism on that and discovered that you know, there may be something more insidious going on um, in this analysis than, than obvious uh, justifications that we feel are unjust. Um, so I decided to, to build on some previous empirical research and do some of my own to investigate this. 
Um, so the role of context in the charter is really key to the relationship between Section 1 and Section 15 and the issue of them becoming conflated. Because um, a contextual approach can be really difficult to fit into a doctrinal framework. Uh, the Oaks test is inherently contextual, um, as we've seen, because it assesses social and economic and political um, values that motivated the limit on the right. And in law in Canada in 1999, the court confirmed that Section 15 is also a broadly contextual analysis and outlined four contextual factors as part of the human dignity assessment. So the result of having these two contextual tests um, next to each other is that there's a danger of significant overlap between them. And uh, critics such as Christopher Brett and Peter Hogg have identified um, this danger and outlined some particular areas of, being, of concern that I've just put into a little chart here. So these are some things that Brett identified. Um, and so under law, there's four contextual factor, factors that you see here. Um, the one uh, not listed is the um, history of disadvantage. So, um, sorry, historical disadvantage. But we have the other three here, and sort of a brief description of what they are. So, the correspondence factor is assessing the legitimacy of the purpose and reasonableness of using the ground to accomplish it. It's looking at the correspondence between um, the limit and the circumstances of the claimant. And so that seems to overlap quite a bit with the rational connection test. Uh, the nature of the interest affected, um, the court has indicated that more severe and localized effects are more likely to be considered discrimination. And so that tends to overlap with the overall balancing part of the proportionality analysis in Oaks. And then the ameliorative, ameliorative purpose or effect again, is a weighing of interests that seems to, again, overlap with the overall balancing. So these are some criticisms that exist in the literature that I wanted to investigate a little further. But um, as has been pointed out, the jurisprudence on Section 15 is complicated and things have changed since these factors were introduced. Um, so the question arises, you know, have these concerns been eliminated? And my argument is no, they haven't. Um, because although CAP in 2008 uh, sort of reverted to an Andrews analysis, two-step analysis, and did away with human dignity, in Whistler in 2011, the court revived the law contextual factors just under a slightly different framework. Um, that I outlined here. And so I think that um, the same concerns are still likely at play. They've just been organized differently. So at least until the court decides to change the test again, my argument is that these concerns expressed by academics after the law case are still going to continue to be re relevant under Whistler for the time being. So I did a little bit of qualitative analysis, first of all, and looked at uh, Le Bois in 2002 and the Canadian Foundation for Children, Youth, and the Law in 2004 as two cases where um, the court actually explicitly acknowledges this problem of Section 1 and Section 15 both being broadly contextual and how to sort out which factors <coughs> belong where. Um, oh. Okay, um, so uh, both, right, in these cases the court explicitly acknowledges this problem, um, but there's a difference in how the majority and dissent judgments in each of these cases decide to address it, and it shows sort of a situation of a bit of judicial discord or disagreement of how this should be managed. Um, particularly in the Canadian Foundation case, the same considerations are determinative for both the majority judgment and uh, Justice Binney in dissent. However, the majority includes these considerations under Section 15, whereas the dissent includes them under Section 1. So it's really a, that case is really a pretty clear example of how 
the court can sort of choose to shoehorn these contextual factors into either the Section 15 or Section 1 analysis, depending on their approach. And what I see as sort of the major difference between these two approaches is whether the perspective of those other than the claimant are a major part of the analysis at the Section 15 stage or the Section 1 stage. So I observed these, um, this issue in the jurisprudence and it read some commentary on it and I wanted to see, okay, is this reflected in trends in the jurisprudence? Um, so I built on a paper by Ryder et al. and did um, some of my own research as well. So this slide just shows um, where cases between 2001 and 2011 were decided at the Supreme Court of Canada level and at the appeal court level. This was quite fun to do because you don't usually get to do charts in law school, so I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, so at the Supreme Court of Canada, 25% of the cases actually made it to section one and were decided at that point, and 33% at the Court of Appeals. So that's proportionally a fairly low number, but this still really isn't enough evidence to completely support um, the academic's ob observations. There's a lot of um, possible explanations for this trend. So I wanted to look a little further and look at um, of the cases that failed, where was the, where did the failure happen? And I adapted some of the methodology from the Ryder paper. So a large proportion if we look at the cases after law on the right hand side, 54.5% of them were decided at the contextual factor stage. So that's a very large proportion and a huge increase from in Andrews, uh, the discrimination stage in Andrews. So that lends support to the academic criticism that you know these law contextual fa factors, although valuable in some ways, um, are becoming increasingly important and really reducing, potentially reducing the impact of Section 1. And of these factors, uh, the correspondence factor seem to be the most important to the court's decision. This slide is a little bit misleading. Um, all in, but when I say in every case, I mean at the Supreme Court of Canada, and every case where contextual factors were actually addressed. There are some cases where the court obviously doesn't get to that stage. So, but where they did, um, correspondence, was correlated, the correspondence factor was correlated to the result of the discrimination finding every time. So if they found there was no correspondence between the needs of the claimant and the law, there was uh, discrimination. If they found there was correspondence, there was no discrimination. I then sort of expanded on, Ryder looked at the overall success rate of equality claims, and I sort of used some of their data to um, expand it up to 2011 and found that actually under Andrews and under the law factors, the success rate is exactly the same. So the question kind of arises, like, so what? So why does it matter where the decision is made if the ultimate outcome on the case is the same? Uh, the literature has already identified some impl implications of the trend. Um, there's a shift in evidentiary burden to the claimant to show that the law does not correspond with their needs instead of the government justifying the law. And there's a bit of a lower bar, arguably, for the government because they have two chances to justify um, the infringement. And some have said this is leading to a weakening of Section 15 rights. And I propose there are also um, potential impacts for social movements more broadly. Um, Firstly, in the kind of equality claims that the court is likely to recognize under Section 15. And secondly, in the value of using litigation as a strategy for social movements. And the broad concern here is that the incursion of contextual considerations such as the legislative purpose or resource, resource allocation to other groups uh, into Section 15 may downplay the voice of the claimants themselves. Um, so I just want to briefly read this uh, great quote from Colleen Shepard um, about the importance of, of context and um, privileging the voice of the claimant at the Section 15 stage. 
The experiential knowledge of those without power must be given a predominant role in developing strategies for change. It is unlikely that those who have enjoyed power and privilege based on the historical institutional status quo will be capable of imagining the kinds of transformations needed to implement human rights norms. To them, exclusionary norms and practices often appear necessary despite their unfortunate effects on those who have been denied equality rights. And so this isn't about trying to say, you know, big bad government. The government may be trying to do the right thing, but because of the different perspective, may not realize the effects it's having. And so by letting these other considerations that belong under section one come into section 15, maybe affecting the court's assessment of the claimant's perspective and experience because it's influenced by this other perspective, maybe more common perspective that the court, members of the court and most people in the courtroom are used to. So the first impact I talked about was the kind of equality claims the court is likely to recognize. Uh, Nancy Fraser has identified two kinds of claims, um, recognition claims for an acknowledgement of difference and for affirmation of the value in that difference and then redistribution claims that call for an erasure of difference, um, often in economic arrangements. And so there's two types of claims that I would like to suggest are particularly vulnerable to failure under the current framework um, following these trends. The first is recognition claims by a group with values particularly divergent from the mainstream. Uh, and I don't have time to get into it in depth, but I would point you to the um, Terrian Brethren case that was mentioned earlier is one potential example of that. Uh, and secondly, redistribution claims by the most marginalized groups in Canada, because it would also, sorry, would also be vulnerable, I think, under this framework. Because when a law's noble purpose is brought into the Section 15 analysis, it can sort of supersede or, or dominate over a careful examination of the law's effects. Uh, the second impact that I talked about was law as a tool for social movements. So I think social movements often use litigation um, for the communicative power that law can have and the power that you can get from having your disadvantage named as an infringement of a right. Now, if a right is found under Section 15, but still justified under Section 1, this can still be used as a political tool and sort of, sort of a galvanizing tool, because you've had your, dis, your disadvantage named as a rights infringement. It's been recognized by the wider community. And this can explain injustice in terms understandable to those who are outside of the claimant's perspective, perhaps very far from the claimant's perspective. However, if it's decided at Section 15, you don't get as much access to this charter rights discourse um, because the problem that you presented to the court is not characterized as a rights infringement. So this trend of conflation between Section 1 and Section 15 can weaken the usefulness of litigation for social movements in having um, their situation named by a court, you know, a source of authority as a rights infringement. So ultimately, what I see is the importance here is keeping the claimant's voice and lived experiences <coughs> apart from analyzing the state's good intentions. Um, Kurt Schwartz has a great quote in a paper uh, that says, just as the road to hell may be paved with good intentions, so too may a well-intentioned law involve an abject disregard for consequences. So again, this isn't about demonizing government objectives, it's about cases where they may be trying to do the right thing, but that shouldn't be enough to say that it's not discrimination. For the charter to be expansive and progressive and do its work, and for Oaks to uphold the principles of a free and democratic society, Oaks must be kept analytically distinct from the rights to which it is applied. Because only then do the voices of the marginalized have the chance to speak uninterrupted. Thank you. I open it up for questions. Any questions for uh, 
for uh, uh, Claire. I have one. It's not dealt with in your paper, but um, you're, you looked at this issue so closely. I'm wondering if you can help me out with something. I've often been mystified uh, about why in other sections of the Charter, like for instance Section 2B, a relatively simple test, and you jet off to Section 1 right away, and we see, I'm sure if we ran the stats on freedom of expression cases under 2B, the stats would probably approach maybe 70, 80, 90 percent going to Section 1, being decided there. Uh, do you have any theories could you venture any theories about why Section 15 has been treated so differently? About why uh, the hard work has been uh, forced to be done under Section 15 rather than Section 1? Um, that's a good question. I'll try to advance a theory. Um, I think in a lot of cases, the court seems very concerned about emphasizing that not all distinctions are discrimination. And I think there's some concern with naming things as discrimination. And, and also some concern with the, dare I say, the optics of saying this is discrimination, but it's okay, it's justified. I think that's something that the court is struggling with a little bit. Um, and uh, some judgments has, have also expressed, um, for example, the dissent in uh, Le Bois expresses a concern that if Section 15 is applied too widely, that it will then be really easily overcome in Section 1, and it'll just be, um, I believe it's termed in that case something like, you know, a really wide but very thin guarantee. And so I think that's a considerable concern in a lot of these judgments, and that may be partly why they're doing more work in Section 15. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the impressions I get in the Section 15 case law is that um, there are many more tests than there, in terms of how they're, um, uh, how they're expressed, um, than there are really tests. That there's just all this, um, the, the, these different verbal formulations for the same tests. And so you, you're, you just get glazed over because it's so hard to keep this in your head. You need a chart because, of, I mean, that's charts, the charts are very helpful because they can say, oh, there are 27 things going on. Um, so that, that's a comment. But the next thing I wonder is, well, it's not only um, going on within particular sections, but it's also this bleeding of a session one into particular sections. So it's, it's, not, it's not just um, section 15, of course, it's happening in other places too. So one of the things I always ask myself is, uh, is do we have such a limited set of, of steps or tests um, that, that um, the only way we can make enough to distribute them into the right and the limitation is um, to just give the same test different words. And of course, that's so problematic when you have the two stages and the ownership. I mean, it's, it's crucial um, for success to be in the, in the, on the right, in the right um, stage, um, in term, just in terms of the onus. So I wonder, first of all, do you agree that there's just all, well, I think you would as much as said it, that there's just all these things that are just same, but they being given different names. And do you think that there is some way of disentangling enough so that um, these ideas aren't sufficiently um, so that we could have some kind of session with me and different kinds of session? Um, this is on? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I do agree that I think to a fairly large extent a lot of the tests are same or similar thing with different names. I think that that really came out in the research I was doing. Um, I sort of stayed away from suggesting solutions in my paper because I think it's a really difficult thing to figure out. Um, 
one of the things that I sort of focused on is, and this is related to the onus, is, is what perspective is the court viewing it from? Are they viewing it from the perspective of the claimant or the perspective of the uh, government? And and who has the onus? I think that's one way to help try to keep them distinct. I don't think it will necessarily completely solve the problem, but I think that's one approach that might be able to help a little bit um, in distinguishing the different uh, stages aside from creating new tests. And um, we've seen there's been a lot of changes in section 15, so at least as far as characterization of the tests, so maybe there are more coming, but Aside from changing the test, the only thing that I could come up with was focusing on different perspectives and the different tests and keeping those distinct. Well, let's move on to our next speaker, and that will be Aaron Smith. But first, uh, Claire, once again, congratulations and thank you for a superb presentation. Okay, Aaron Smith, third year at Queen's University on her paper, Efficiency is the Only Reasonable Limit, How Section 1 is an Efficient Breach Analysis. So thank you very much, Justice Stratus, and I'll echo Claire's. Thank you to the Rachel Gold and the University of Ottawa Law Review and everyone organizing the symposium. It's a real privilege to be here and a very humbling experience to be speaking at the same conference as the many uh, uh, more, di uh, more dignified, not dignified, that's the wrong word, uh, the, or dig the dignitaries really who are speaking here today with much more experience. So my paper offers an economic analysis of section one. And I'm gonna start off today by just briefly explaining to you my thesis, then about how I think my paper might contribute to the debate or the literature, the scholarship. Briefly explain two background concepts I think are really key to getting what I'm saying. I'm gonna dive into the guts of my paper and then provide a very short example at the end. So to start off, my paper combines law and economics, constitutional law, and, con and contracts law. My thesis is basically I consider whether section one can be seen as an efficient breach analysis. So whether the court, when the court considers section one, are they really like a business person, considering whether, whether they should breach their current contract so that they can enter into a new contract, which way is the best way to maximize their resources? Obviously a big difference is, of course, the business person is thinking only about their resources, whereas the court is thinking about society's resources. So my motivation for picking this, one might say bizarre subject, was that just to offer a unique look at section one and a unique perspective on it. And I think that's what it can add to the, to the debate. I think a criticism could be that saying efficient breach and using that as an analytical framework is just maybe a fancier way of saying balancing, which is of course always used to discuss section one. But I don't think that's quite the case. I think they, those two words are separate. I think they are different words. And I think the difference in those words is where the value lies. The uniqueness of efficiency is where the value lies in this analysis. I think balancing is more imprecise and it's more focused on the process. Whereas efficiency lends itself to being defined more precisely and it also has a little bit more of a focus on an outcome. So because of these differences in efficiency versus balancing, I think that using this efficient breach analysis does have some value. So now I'm gonna briefly go over the two background concepts I think are, are key to getting what I'm trying to say. The first one is the definition of efficiency. So put in stark terms, efficiency is simply getting the most benefit out of the least cost. But it's important to note that efficiency isn't just about money or resources, as although it's often thought of that way. It can take into account any priorities in society, any desirable outcomes of society. Efficiency is about the optimal allocation of resources, but society and the societal context gets to decide what optimal means. Efficiency is informed, so another way of saying this is that efficiency is informed by society's values and our morals. It's not just this naked concept all about money and resources. 
And just one note, for my purposes, that there's different definitions of efficiency, of course. For my purposes, I'll be using a definition that looks at the overall utility to society as opposed to the utility to the individual. The second concept, and this is the last background concept, I know this isn't too exciting yet, uh, is efficient breach theory itself. So I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but just as a bit of a, a, bit of a primer. Efficient breach is the notion that there are circumstances where better allocation of resources will be achieved uh, if a contract is breached. So these circumstances arise when the costs of performance exceed the benefits of performance. And the theory, efficient breach theory, states that when these sorts of circumstances occur, the law should encourage the contract to be breached. So now that I've given you those two background concepts, I've given you a bit of an overview of what I'm saying, I'm going to launch into the guts of my paper which is how the general structure of Section 1 fits my thesis. Overall, the Section 1 analysis is trying to find out whether the harm to the individual is outweighed by the good to society. Put another way, does the infringement result in a more efficient allocation of societal resources? So to jump right into the Oaks test and the uh, first part of the Oaks test, pressing and substantial concern, Sorry, just to back up for a second. So basically in my paper what I do is I go through every step of the Section 1 analysis, including prescribed by law, which I'll skip today, and just show how it reinforces this idea, or within the analysis you can see the efficient breach analysis coming through and how it, it fits what I'm trying to say. So I'll just jump right into pressing and substantial concern. So in the, when they're discussing the substantive, when the court goes through and finds that the substantive, law, the substantive charter right has been infringed, which of course is necessary to get to section one, that's the proof that the uh, individual has lost something. So we already know that. When we get to pressing and substantial concern, the court wants to find out, well, what's the potential loss to the government or the court of who's representing society? And so that's what the process of pressing and substantial concern is trying to set up, is the cost benefit to the, to the government. They've already established the cost benefit to the individual. Moving now to the rational connection part. Uh, if pressing and substantial concern defines the potential gain or loss of society, rational connection makes sure that the impugn law is actually connected to that pressing and substantial concern. Because if it's not, the pressing concern rings hollow. It's not there. And if there's no gain to society, then we're not going to infringe the individual's right. That just doesn't make sense. There's no, it wouldn't be an efficient breach. The next step, so, so we've established that the, there is a sincere potential gain or loss to society and to the individual. We now move to minimal impairment. Essentially, by structuring the test this way, the court is saying that society values rights so much, and we can see that by the fact that they codified it in the charter. The society values rights so much that infringement will never be justified when those rights are limited more than is necessary. So, in other words, to allow a non-minimally impairing infringement of rights would be an inefficient breach. So by structuring it this way, just another, another catch to make sure that only efficient breach, only potentially efficient breach uh, infringements of rights pass through before we get to the, of course, real um, this, the part of the section one test where you can really see the efficient breach analysis, which is the proportionality step, the last step. So this step, as I said, clearly shows the efficient breach analysis because it's about determining whether society will be better off, that is whether social welfare will be maximized if we privilege the government's policy over the individual's freedom. And, and you can see the efficient, analysis, efficient breach analysis step. You can imagine a business person doing a similar analysis here most clearly because it's, most, it's the most clear cost-benefit analysis. But I do think all the prior steps contribute to setting it up. So you have the pressing and substantial concern and rational connection setting up whether there's that cost-benefit. You have minimal impairment uh, inserting in, in the definition of efficiency those societal values, saying we really value rights. So you have to make sure that this is, this is the least, least infringing way the, or the most efficient way to violate those rights. So just now that I've sort of gone through the guts, I just want to provide a brief example. Uh, in my paper, in, I look at two examples, the Nape case, which we've talked about quite a bit today, and the Thompson newspapers case. 
and I go through and actually use it using quotations, use the language of the court to show this underlying, this sort of implicit efficient breach analysis going on using their own words. However, reading a bunch of quotations to you isn't very interesting, so I won't be doing that, don't worry. But uh, that is there. And I think when you really see the language of the court and the sort of language they're using, and you see, you see that this analysis is how it can underpin their judgments. So as I said, I use NAEP and I use Thompson newspapers. Now, we've discussed NAEP a lot, and some of you may be thinking, well, that's sort of an unfair example to use because the facts of the case are so rooted in resources that it's maybe a little too on point and, it's, and thus it's not representative and too easy to make the case in that situation. So to make it more interesting, I'm, I'm going to talk to you today about the Thompson newspaper example, which is a much harder case to make, I think, to fit my theory to it than the Nate case, which I think very, really does clearly show, clearly um, support my thesis. So in Thompson newspaper, it's concerned about a section of the Canadian Elections Act which uh, forbid the publication of election survey results, so prior to the election um, polls, uh, uh, you know, a few days prior to the election, so three days before the election you can't publish polls anymore. And the, app, the uh, applicants were saying that, well, this violates our freedom of expression, our 2B right. And Justice Bashbrash, writing from the majority, agreed that it did, did violate their two, Section 2B right, and also uh, said it was it was not justifiable under Section 1. And in Thompson, the interesting thing here is that the cost-benefit analysis done is really between different values. So the value of protecting people from possibly incorrect information, which is what the law was trying to do, and versus freedom of expression, which is what the, you know, the applicant is saying, this is upsetting me because I can't freely express myself. And that's, of course, like a stark contrast to the NAEP, where you have really resources on on both sides, really. Resources and, and on one side, of course, resources and equality. So back to Thompson, as Justice Bastrash, writing for the majority, he goes through the analysis, he really downplays the benefits that infringing the rights would achieve in comparison to the cost of infringement, or as it's framed in the judgment, he actually pretty much said there is no benefit to infringing these rights. He questions the uh, efficacy of the law, suggesting it doesn't even do what it purports to do. Um, and in this way, I really, I think it, when you read the judgment and you see the language he's using and you see the sort of way he sets it up by setting up the costs and the benefits that are alleged and going through and seeing what's happening, I really do think it is like a, a court is acting as a business person would, looking at the options to breach or to stay with the original contract. And in this case, the sides are no point in breaching, i.e. finding the charter violation justifiable because they won't gain anything new with the new contract. Uh, essentially, the court is saying to allow the law to continue would be an inefficient breach of charter rights, unless they don't allow it. So, just to briefly conclude, what's my point? Or as one of my professors likes to ask me, what is your normative punchline? <laughs> and my point isn't to say that this should or should not happen, but merely to point out that it I think it is happening, and I think it, there's a value in seeing it from this perspective and from looking at it from a different perspective. An underlying sort of an underlying point in my paper, though a bigger, more meta point, if you will, is that we shouldn't be afraid of bringing law and economics into conversations like this one, conversations that are usually rooted in values and talked about in terms of values. I think sometimes people are reluctant. To to talk about things like con economics and efficiency in the same conversation as values because they feel they don't belong together. But I do think there's a role for law and economics to play in discussions about values, and I think that it can be an important and insightful part of the conversation. And I hope my paper has somewhat contributed to that, and I thank you very much and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. I'll just do my best to speak up, considering the issues we're having. But um, I, I understand the point that you're you're making with your analysis and kind of saying that in conducting this kind of theoretical overview, saying that this is the way courts are operating, 
you know, you're saying we should use this terminology because there's, you know, there's precision in the terminology. It kind of helps to identify what's going on and perhaps the way we should be looking at issues in the future. But my concern is, like, when again, like, you know, law and economics and anything contractual to me is, you know, kind of almost a magical or voodoo terminology. <laughs> it's just not something that I immediately understand. So if you're talking about bringing a law and economics analysis, it's something that's, again, on my kind of cursory understanding, very, very quantitative. <laughs> Something where you know you are in an efficient breach situation, you're weighing the pros and cons, and it's actually almost a numbers game. You can say like this costs more than the benefits yield. It's a quantitative analysis. How do you kind of successfully import import that as an analytical framework in what is in essence a qualitative analysis and dealing with intangibles? And do you run run the risk that kind of Dr. that Professor Chatterjee alluded to earlier? of saying, okay, well, like, yes, the right is at issue here, but the cost is simply, the actual numerical cost is simply too much. Like, courts haven't done that. Do you kind of run that gamut, run that risk by bringing in this analysis? I think it's a great question, and I don't know if it's not on, so I try to. Is it on now? Oh, I think it's, is it on now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ever present. Okay, anyway, I'll just talk. I have a lot of voice, so it's no problem. Uh, I think that's a great question. I think the answer to that is to, is to go back to my definition. <laughs> go back to my definition of efficiency, which I do. which is about go back to my definition of efficiency and say that it's more than just about costs. It's more than just about resources. You can also import those societal values, those societal context in there. And I think the minimal impairment step is a good example of that. Is the court, if you look at it from the efficient breach analysis, is the court saying, look, we think by codifying these charter rights, we've identified them as so important that to breach them, you have to do it very minimally. So I think by taking a broader definition of efficiency, by making sure that it includes the definition of efficiency is informed by our societal norms and values, by our, our the high premium we put on protecting people's rights, I don't think that necessarily is a problem. Question at the back. Uh, thank you. That was uh, very interesting. So I uh, also do not really know much about law and economics, other than the rent, as I read from Richard Posner occasionally. Um, so the in law and economics, when you talk about an efficient breach, a situation of efficient breach, and then there's going to be continued contact between the parties, I would assume that that might be something that would come into play in determining whether a breach might be efficient in that particular circumstance. So in the context of a legislature or an executive actor making a decision about efficient breach, have you given any thought to how that then affects the relationships, the public governance relationships, the relationships between state and citizen, confidence, rule of law concerns going forward, if you're applying that analysis? So what, if any, is the analysis that of that kind of concern, which I assume would would be a concern in the law and economics context, and how would you accommodate that in your analysis in the charter realm? So I think that's a great question, and I think you're totally right that relationships are something that need to be taken into account, especially when you're considering breaching a contract. I did not consider that at all, but a just a brief response would be. I, my paper was really from the from the folk, from the viewpoint of the courts. So what do the courts is doing the efficient breach analysis? Where I think your question is getting at if the legis what, what concerns the legislature should have when they're deciding to breach people's rights. And the court is this neutral third, you know, in theory anyway, it's a neutral third party, right? They're not they don't have they're not concerned about relationships. They're concerned about coming to the just decision where I think your question gets to what should the legislatures be concerned about when they're considering uh, putting these, you know, putting in these rights violating laws in, in that? Well, just, to, just a, a brief rejoinder, I think they would be concerned about that at the remedy stage. They would, it's, it's um, an overt consideration under section 24.2, and I think it, it if you're talking about what they're considering as efficient, even the remedies under the supremacy clause often will have regard to those to those larger relationships. So I'm not so sure there's such a neat divide between between the branches. 
Well, my response to your rejoinder would be, I do not consider that at all. Those are all really good points, and I will definitely have to think about that, because I, yeah, that definitely did not consider that. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Aaron, thank you very much again for a wonderful day. Final uh, student today presenting the paper Braden the Balance Oaks Analysis Restaged is Mark Zion from the University of Alberta. Good afternoon. Thank you for hosting this uh, symposium. Uh, and uh, my thesis is that stage four of the Oaks test ought to be more determinative of case outcomes. Uh, the Hutterite uh, case, Hutterian uh, Brethren Wilson Colony, has been mentioned a lot. And the idea for the paper came out of that case. There's sort of a lot of uh, factual uh, anomalies that we can point to in, in the case that created what I think was a pretty unpopular result, at least um, in the academy. But my focus was more on, on structure, Ask, asking whether if we change the structure of the Oaks test, we might be able to prevent some of these undesirable uh, outcomes from, from reoccurring. Uh, and so my ideal uh, structure um, for the test is actually to make stage one more uh, permissive. So rather than requiring a pressing and substantial objective, uh, simply uh, a reasonable uh, objective. I know that term is itself fraught, but just uh, not, uh, if we're, if we're going to allow most cases through the gate at stage one anyways, best not to call them pressing substantial at that point. Let that determination be made at stage four. Stage two, I would leave alone. Uh, rational connection has a basis in the analysis. Even if uh, laws have uh, a reasonable uh, objective, the objective may not be connected to the content of the law, obviously. Uh, and then for stage three, I would change things quite a bit. I would go back to the initial uh, wording of Oaks, which is the least restrictive means. So it's a test of strict Pareto uh, optimality, and I'll get into that more uh, shortly. And then for uh, stage four, um, I would like to see many more cases uh, decided at this, this stage. And uh, I, I'm not sure um, how much I would change the way that the Supreme Court presently conducts stage four, um, other than uh, with some theory from uh, Robert uh, Alexi, who uh, uh, sort of looks at sort of the situation in Germany where stage four is relied on quite a bit and uh, sort of provides a theoretical framework for stage four that could make it work a bit more efficiently. Uh, so um, just looking at uh, the way I approach the, the structural problem, sort of a narrow structural focus, but it has a historical, uh, comparative, and uh, theoretical and inst institutional role components. I'm going to focus on the comparative element uh, today, but just pointing history briefly, I thought it was really interesting. Most countries that rely on sort of this four-stage framework that emerged in the post-war paradigm resolve cases at stage four. So the vast majority of cases in Canada resolve at stage three. There have been sort of increasing nods to stage four, but it's still very much uh, stage three. And it's actually, I think Toronto Star was the one case, was a publication ban case, that came after uh, the Hunter 8 case. Um, and uh, we were right back to stage three after even the majority in, in the Tyrian uh, brethren stated that uh, stage four would be very instrumental uh, going forward. Actually, Justice Appella in her lone dissent did exactly what I wanted uh, the judges to do in the Hutterite uh, case, which was to have the, the case turn on on stage four, but that's still very much uh, the exception. So just getting into a comparative uh, perspective, uh, the way that, um, that uh, Israel uh, conducts Oaks analysis is actually very similar to the way that uh, the German Constitutional uh, Court uh, does it. And so just uh, looking at the case of Bates Week, I think it's really informative uh, in relation to the uh, Algerian case. And the case involved a security wall in the West Bank. It was a 40 kilometer wall that the Israeli Defense Forces insisted was necessary in order to prevent uh, terrorist incursions uh, into uh, Jerusalem. And uh, the, the uh, rights claims were, were farmers in this case whose lands would be bisected by the wall. They were concerned about uh, having their property rights violated. Obviously, they'd have to travel um, through the wall to access their farmland. It would impinge on their ability to, to farm. And they were concerned about their mobility rights, having to wait many hours, possibly, at uh, checkpoints. So those things were both problematic. Um, going to, to stage one um, of the uh, the test, uh, Justice Barack 
uh, allowed the Israeli Defense Forces a lot of leeway in defining their uh, objective. And uh, he, you know, there, there was not a lot of discussion at, at stage one. Stage two also sort of flowed straightforwardly um, from stage one. And then it was at stage three where things got really interesting. And um, with the strict credo requirement, you have to ask whether there is any measure that achieves the objective to exactly the same extent, but without compromising the rights of, of, of the rights holder. Uh, to any greater degree. And so the answer really to that question was that there was no route for the security wall that would achieve the exact same amount of, of security without compromising the Haaretz, uh, sorry, in the wrong case, uh, without compromising the farmers that uh, rights any uh, less. And that's really important. And so as we go into stage four, it was actually this stage where uh, Barack did a quite an elaborate um, a balancing uh, activity and determined that even though no wall could be proposed, uh, they would achieve the objective to the same extent without interfering with, with rights to any greater extent. The wall still uh, had to be uh, modified because the deleterious effects were too great. And what's really interesting is this, is, this illustrates a relative approach to balancing, where if a measure is uh, unconstitutional, the, the government can work with the court to come up with an alternative that is sort of uh, intermediate. In this case, a small change in the route uh, affected farmers to a much smaller extent while completely achieving or, or nearly achieving the security uh, objective. And the other interesting um, thing about Barack's approach through these stages is that at the first uh, stage, the government is given a lot of uh, leeway, and so the, the character of the analysis is quite legislative. But as you move through the stages, it becomes increasingly uh, legal or uh, judicial. So that by the time you get to stage four, uh, the, the court is engaged in searching inquiry into the full extent of the rights compromised to the claimants holder and what the actual effects would would be um, on the part of the government. And I think Barack is, is heavily informed by Robert Alexie's theory at this uh, stage, which just uh, uses um, a weight formula, and it's a mathematical model that can get fairly complicated, and how he derives the values actually are not always clear. Gregor, Gregor Weber has a really good um, article where he sort of looks at some of the assumptions that are made or aren't made in, in mathematizing the different uh, quantities, but the, the concrete weight is sort of what decides whether the claimant's right or the uh, government's uh, position uh, triumphs. And it looks at the interferences with the various uh, rights. So uh, slight infringement is geometrically easier to justify than a severe infringement. It looks at sort of the abstract weights of the different rights. So um, a measure, uh, something like, I think a good example would be uh, political expression would have a higher abstract weight than commercial expression, but generally it's not possible to hierarchize right. So in both Bates Creek and the Hutterite case, it's not possible. You just assign a value with one. Um, and then finally, the, the third thing considered is the reliability um, of, of the uh, factual estimates made on both sides. And uh, and Barack essentially decided that because the, the wall uh, would impose such an undue uh, burden on the, on the rights claims, it could not be uh, justified at, at stage four. And I think that a lot of his, his reasoning um, is it should have been informative for uh, what happened in, in the Hadron case. So that, in that case, we have um, a measure that's deemed pressing and substantial right out of the gate. So Professor Paul points out that it, uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult for something to fail at stage four once it's already been deemed pressing and substantial. Uh, certainly, the idea that uh, the uh, photo, universal photograph requirement in the Hutterite case was pressing is really questionable. You could say that the uh, publication ban in uh, Toronto Star was pressing because it involved uh, pre-trial fairness and very immediate issues that were of concern to, to the criminal uh, claimants in, in those cases, but the same uh, could not be said for the photograph requirement because the law essentially existed since 1974, which allowed an exemption for, for the Hutterites. Um, 
And so that was uh, sort of an interesting thing about uh, stage one, just make, make it sort of more lenient, either appropriate or, or reasonable would have been uh, better. And then for rational connection, same thing as in Beit Sarika, I would leave that alone. For least restrictive means, this was really interesting. You see a lot of reasoning that should actually take place in stage four occurring in stage three in the Hatterian uh, case. So Justice McLaughlin sort of indicated that there was a concern, sort of a floodgates concern, about an untold number of religious objectors uh, being able to uh, object to, to, to laws of universal uh, application. And that's really an effects-based uh, concern. It shouldn't have appeared in stage three. Stage three should strictly ask whether there was an alternative measure that would have achieved the government's objective to exactly the same extent. Uh, in this case, the Hutterites proposed a uh, non-identification license, which didn't have a photo on it uh, that could be used in place of the photographic uh, licenses. and. I struggled with this while I was writing my paper because that becomes, it's actually very close to being Pareto optimal, but again, stages two and three are very closely tied to stage one's objective. So if the government says that you need a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many correspondence between photographs in the data bank and faces of people who possess licenses, you, you can't really mess with that at stage three. It has to be considered uh, at stage uh, four. So finally, um, at stage four, this is where if, if Alexia's uh, formula were applied, or if, if Barack's reasoning were, were applied, um, the, the law would, would really easily have been uh, struck down in, in my view, because Justice McLaughlin made sort of an offhand remark that the Hutterites may simply have to hire drivers uh, in order to, uh, you know, avoid uh, in order to comply with, with the law. But uh, the Alberta Court of Appeal um, pointed out uh, just how important, how central driving was to the Hutterite uh, lifestyle. And even though driving is not the religious right per se, just how closely it touches on the central uh, concern of the religious right. So it says that um, the, the Alberta Court of Appeal said that the, the uh, driving is needed to facilitate the sale of agricultural products, purchase raw materials from suppliers, transport colony members, uh, including children to medical appointments, and conduct the community's uh, financial affairs. So it, it just the, the extent to which this was dramatic uh, intrusion was not appreciated uh, by the majority. Um, and so the, the deleterious effects weren't adequately appreciated. Um, the salutary effects were also weren't adequately characterized. Um, Justice McLaughlin um, sort of uh, took the, continued to take the government's word in stage four that sort of flowed from the, the objective um, when stage four really should be uh, a separate <coughs> Uh, matter. It shouldn't relate to uh, the objective um, at all. Um, and so uh, the, 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 one of the comments that Justice Bell made in her dissent that was really uh, telling was that there are 700,000 uh, people in Alberta who don't have driver's licenses uh, at all. And so the idea that this was necessary to prevent uh, identity theft was, was somewhat uh, questionable, and it was sort of an importation of the government's objective into a stage that should have been purely about uh, costs and, and uh, benefits. So um, I, I sort of wondered about why exactly it, it was uh, that stage three is, is so determinative in, in Canada at this point. And, um, I think that it just has to do part, it has to do partly with with misplaced views about judicial deference, um, and so I think it, it's really important that in Alexi's weight formula, deference doesn't sort of fit into the equation. So it's very important that the the claimant's uh, claim is considered in in total, the government's position is considered in total. But the government mustn't get points just for being government. It, it, it needs to be sort of a, a careful uh, contextual uh, balancing uh, approach. Um, and so I think that the, the Oaks framework uh, can, be, can be useful, it's salvageable if it's reworked, but I also in the paper wanted to address uh, some, some critics who say that proportionality analysis in general is, is counterproductive in terms of uh, realizing rights. And um, I think that this is, um, the discussion becomes somewhat uh, problematic of, Greg Horne Weber sort of invokes uh, some, some deontological perspectives from, from Rawls, from Habermas, from others who sort of view rights as firewalls against uh, state coercion. And so the feeling is 
that if we use something like a weight formula, which again is sort of borderline economic analysis, um, we're sort of relativizing what in many cases should be uh, absolute prohibitions. Weber again and again in his paper talks about the need for an absolute prohibition on torture. And I think that the best response to that is that it's simply a bit um, uh, fanciful. There, there's there, one answer to the question is sort of a utilitarian um, approach, which is sort of like what, what um, Peter Singer describes in, in his uh, ethical discussion, which is, well, if you have someone who's going to be imminently tortured, then, uh, or sorry, if you have an imminent threat of a bomb going off in New York City and torture is the only way to extract relevant information, you have to go ahead and torture. So everything can essentially be relativized. And you don't even have to believe that to be a proponent of, of uh, balancing because there's an absolute prohibition against torture already existent in our criminal code. And so the types of rights conflicts that, that come into play in Oak's analysis are really much more uh, complex and, and nuanced. Um, the the uh, rights terrain in any one case is often very overdetermined and multifaceted, and to simply say, well, uh, we need certain rights to work as firewalls or to have absolute prohibitions doesn't reflect the, the complexity of the, the rights terrain. Um, and so um, and it's interesting to note uh, also that one of the, the, the uh, theorists that Weber invokes is Rawls, who um, in terms of needing sort of absolute prohibitions, but Rawls also talks about uh, sort of a consequentialist criterion for good government, where you judge the government, uh, the government decision procedure by the quality of results that it's able to, to achieve. So I think even on, on that uh, formulation, I mean, obviously stage four is a searching inquiry into the projected uh, effects of, of, of a given uh, limitation. So it's, it's easy to see how, how, that's, uh, how it's relevant. So um, I guess, uh, in conclusion, my, my hopes are somewhat uh, mixed about whether there will be a more decisive move to uh, stage four. But um, I think that some, some initial uh, suggestions from um, from the quarter are promising. And I guess um, one thing that, that just needs to be clarified before I move to is that Justice Abella, in her dissent in uh, Wilson Colony, uh, stated that the stages are not watertight uh, compartments, that uh, proportionality in sort of a larger sense should be considered a stage. And I think that that's fair in terms of how judges actually think about cases. I mean, you can't really think about ends without thinking about means and vice versa. But as far as the stages themselves go, at least in written reasons, they're very straightforward, logical requirements. Um, needing to outline a clear objective, rational connection, minimally restricting means all make a lot of sense before you get into the, the balancing uh, process. So um, I'll be open to any questions. Any questions for Mark? Yes. Thanks, I really enjoyed that paper. Uh, two things that came up all day as problems were failure, failure of the courts to rigor rigorously assess evidence and excessive deference to the state. Is your approach, is there any reason to think that your approach is going to be any better than any other approach in dealing with those two problems? Yes, I mean, that's one of, one of the biggest uh, problems uh, is in uh, who should bear the burden of, of evidence in, in charter cases. Um, and so I think that uh, if uh, stage four um, is, is used to a greater extent, uh, oh, uh, okay. I'll just try to speak out. If stage four is, is, is relied upon to a greater extent, then it doesn't necessarily uh, speak to the evidentiary burden uh, per se, but it just ensures that uh, all of the possible future consequences of a measure are considered more thoroughly in their uh, totality. Um, so, uh, and Justice McLaughlin interestingly has been most clear in calling for, for needing some actual you know, evidence, not just sort of speculation, when, when you deem the measure uh, necessary. So, um, hopefully, if, if there is sort of a searching inquiry in stage four, uh, that would satisfy a uh, more substantial evidentiary burden on the part of the government. It's sort of a collateral issue, but it's, it's really, really important. I don't know if my, my structural approach can completely capture the elementary burden, but I hope it's it. Mark, just, just on that, uh, I'm wondering about a case like Irwin Toy. Uh, you could name others as well, where deference mattered uh, and was a very key 
particularly under the third branch and then the impairment branch. Deference mattered and was key to the results in the case. Under your restaging of the Oaks test, would the result in those cases be different? And you might take Irwin Toy or any other case where you think deference ruled the day. Again, because stage three is still fairly closely wedded to the objective, I actually think that it's, it's okay to, um, to take the government's work to some extent when it says that there's, there's no alternative measure that would achieve its objective to uh, exactly the same extent. Uh, and this is why um, stage four, where stage four comes in, is sort of a closer look at the effects um, there that sort of address. Um, you know, any, any residual deference that's remained at, at stage uh, three. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful that you're looking at all this theoretical material on the comparative case of this that's really important. Um, one of the things that's always bothered me about the big Sarit case is the way Barack used the third stage. So he had the um, official military assessment of where the security <coughs> wall should be. Um, and um, their idea was it had to be um, in a position that was so intrusive on the life, uh, not just the agricultural life, but the whole sort of human family life of the, uh, the village. Um, and the, 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 um, so the official military position was there had to be so much time between um, the wall and the sort of um, what stands as the border between the occupied territories and Israel. And so they needed so much time, and so they counted off that time. And so, uh, unfortunately for the Palestinian uh, farmers, the, uh, they're, um, they're, they're caught in a situation where they can't do, they can't, basically can't live their lives. Um, but there were other experts who had, I think were retired experts from the military, who said, uh, who recommended this other line. Um, where they thought that the uh, there, they, they thought there was enough um, security um, provided in terms of the time for uh, terrorist activity to be detected before it actually hit Israel, and that the um, uh, and the villagers would have their own life. Barak, as you know, because you read the case, rejected that because he said, "I have to defer to the military. They're the experts in the military issue. Um, these other experts are interesting, but they don't have the political." You know, that there is a political responsibility for their position. So I just take the official military position, and I'm the expert in law. So I deal with this at the last stage. But one of the things that I find, it actually goes back to the earlier questions of the um, cases where you have real money on money figures on the table, and then you don't think of anything else. One of, um, and I think that there's um, something artificial going on. But when we have money figures like in Nate, we, we think we're actually assessing something real. Um, and here, we think we're assessing something real. But um, the, the question of how much danger there is and how much time it takes for a terrorist to get from A to B and blow up uh, a blow of a bomb, all of these things um, uh, get us into a, a kind of assessment of what we think are actually real quantities. And I'm not sure they're quantities. Also, the idea that the, um, the government knows, in any example, or in this example, how much danger there actually is and what they're combating, and then they wait and say, I find this very, very artificial. And one of the things that um, uh, I know is talked about in Israel about this case is that um, the real concern is that if you um, leave this Palestinian uh, village without its access to its livelihood, and also without access to doctors and education and family and et cetera, it's just that, um, because of where they place the wall, you're manufacturing terrorists. So that you're actually increasing the danger by putting the wall in the place where the military thinks that there's the most security given. So there's so many factors here, and I just um, wonder if we get uh, this sort of some magnetic pull to things that either are quantifiable because they're money, like in Maine, or something that the experts tell us is quantifiable. And this idea that the same amount of security or the same amount of this or that as, as the objective would produce, the objective for the first state, 
I don't think this is this is actually something that makes any sense. I don't think it's a hard statistic. Or a, and now we've, now we've placed so much importance on it in the third stage. Uh, I agree with a lot of that, and it just shows how strict the pre optimality requirement uh, can can be um, in, in that particular uh, case. Um, I, I suppose that um, what you're also raising, I think, is a commensurability um, exactly. problem. That um, just to sort of um, <coughs> see simply small sort of what that that is. And a good example of, of a commensurable quantity would be um, sort of in, in utilitarian theory that it's happy to see some things. To which something produces happiness, sort of the universal criteria by which you can sort of uh, judge something. We don't have anything like that in a lot of these the cases, sort of a, a, a really uh, clear, sort of universally acceptable criteria by which we can relativize the, the, the claimant's uh, right to contention and the government's uh, objective. And so if it's problematic, and yet we're, we're called upon in these, in the post war paradigm, to, to reconcile these, these two things. Judges are sort of put in, in the middle of these difficult to commensurate uh, uh, disputes. And so I think that um, the, the, the option of sort of deferring to, to the military uh, at stage three makes sense just because if stage four is deployed the way I want it to be, it is so easy to then try to say, well, even if we take what the military says for, for granted, the, the costs of achieving this objective are just too great. And then it's a process of going back and trying to come up with some sort of, you know, group relative approach to balancing some intermediate uh, approach. There definitely um, aren't easy answers. Uh, the Oaks paradigm is sort of the one that we have, and it's the one I'm trying to, to, to adapt and, and make work, but uh, certainly it's, it's a big issue. It's one of Weber's main themes of the commensurability problem. I don't know we're, we're out of time. <laughs> and uh, Mark, uh, again, congratulations to you. A wonderful presentation. And uh, very incisive answers to the questions. Thank you. Well, one thing is for certain, the future of charter scholarship is bright with these young folk, uh, and it's very hard, as many of us know, to speak at your very first conference. And so, uh, welcome to all the students, and thank you so much. off the evening. I just wanted to thank all of our presenters for coming today and talking about Section 1, so if we could give everyone a big round of applause. So, and people came from all over, not just in Ontario, so there was a lot of people who took more time than others. And I also wanted to thank all of our many sponsors who believed in our goal of uh, creating a, an event that, where we could talk about law and promote uh, legal discourse in an interesting and uh, thought-provoking um, area. So the last, per the last group of people I wanted to thank, which is all the volunteers from the Ottawa Law Review who have made this event possible and have helped out along the way. That includes the editors-in-chief, the senior editors, assistant editors, and first year volunteers who you may have seen throughout the day handing you microphones or helping you with your lunch or telling you how to get to the washroom or things like that. So I just want to thank all of them as well. 